Okay. So again, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse Wheeland. I'm the Associate Director at the Office of National Fellowships at Florida State. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking about the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship, as well as a few uh, other fellowships that you may have some interest in at the very end of this presentation. But the majority of what we're going to be talking about is the Gilman Scholarship. Uh, and so for some of you who may be a little bit um, unfamiliar with the Office of National Fellowships, or if this is your first semester, first year on campus, uh, first of all, welcome. Um, but at the Office of National Fellowships, we kind of use the term scholarship and fellowship a, a little bit interchangeably, kind of depending on the award that we're working with. And sometimes it doesn't always mean the same thing, but, but generally when I'm referring to a fellowship, um, the way that I describe it is that it's a scholarship uh, that has some sort of learning component to it. Uh, so that can be an internship, that can be research, it can be an international experience, but regardless of what it is, uh, by the end of your experience, uh, the end of your fellowship, you'll have learned something, developed a new skill, um, or have grown in some way um, that you can then take that with you and apply it to your studies, apply it to your career, or apply it to whatever may come next. Um, and so with these fellowships, uh, typically, they are nationally competitive. They are um, uh, challenging opportunities to apply for, but again, that's why our office is here to support you through that. Um, and with this added level of competition, that should never be a reason on why you should or should not apply, um, but it's something that we like to make our students aware of. But even with that, um, our acceptance rates for the Gilman Scholarship in particular are uh, extremely high relative uh, to that national average. And so uh, with our office, um, for, for those of you who are kind of new to this realm or new to these types of applications, uh, the benefit of, uh, of coming in to see us or setting up a Zoom call with us uh, is that we can help break down some of these opportunities for you, or just based on your areas of interest, your expertise, uh, maybe research that you're doing, uh, or just things that you want to get involved in or skills that you want to develop, we can help point you in the right direction on what awards relative to your year of study. So whether you're in your first or second year or your third or fourth year, uh, we can help connect you with these different opportunities. And like I said, support you through that process. Um, uh, we also help you manage these applications. Uh, and so usually when we're kind of getting into the throes of the application process, our, our meetings are gonna look like uh, reviewing your statements, your, your statements of purpose, your personal statement. Um, but a lot of these applications have other aspects too, not just letters of recommendation, sometimes letters of affiliation um, that need to come from somebody in the country that you're applying for, um, or language evaluations to determine your proficiency. Um, and so, so we help make sure that you're on top of all of those components and doing what you need to be doing. Doing. Um, the good thing about Gilman, and we'll get into this a little bit later, is that uh, it's kind of geared towards, it's geared toward any undergraduate, but specifically for students that, can, are, that are new to campus. So there are no uh, um, language requirements, there's no letters of recommendation, it's purely focused on your goals, your experiences, and why you're wanting to pursue the opportunity that you're wanting to pursue. Uh, and so a lot of our early meetings, uh, it, it focuses on this structured reflection. Uh, so in the context text of Gilman, uh, when I'm working with students for the first time, uh, it's it's getting to know a little bit more about you, a little bit more about your experiences in high school, your uh, your interests outside of your major, outside of your academics, uh, because a lot of those elements and those experiences and those stories are, are really important when it comes to your Gilman application, and that's really what these review committees are wanting to see. Uh, so it's it's not it's not just focused on writing your essays from the get go. It's getting to know a little bit about those stories and those experiences and how those have shaped the goals that you have for yourself and why you're pursuing the opportunities that you're pursuing through Gilman. Um, and then, like I kind of already said, the obvious is we sit down with those essays. I, I try not to use uh, red ink uh, when I'm editing, uh, but, you know, so so don't take all of my feedback uh, as, as negatives. We're, we're, we're here to grow and to learn and to grow as writers. Um, and so that's what I'm here to help you with. Um, and so now kind of moving on and, and, and getting into Gilman specifically. Um, and so generally speaking, uh, so, so Gilman was an opportunity that was created, I believe, I believe this is their, their 20th, uh, 20th year anniversary, um, but was created 20 years ago to provide access uh, to international 
opportunities and study and research and internships um, for, for student populations that have been traditionally underserved or that have um, faced greater challenges in, in terms of accessing these opportunities. Um, and so, so Gilman is looking to uh, recruit students that may come from a lower socio uh, socioeconomic background. Uh, they're looking to recruit students um, that, that may have disabilities that may need uh, additional accommodations when, when studying abroad. They're looking at students who may be active or reserve military members or uh, other students that may be considered uh, non-traditional uh, in the grander scheme of higher education. And so it provides uh, up to $5,000 that you can apply towards any study abroad program that may occur during the fall, during the spring, during the summer, or during the academic year. Um, and with the added challenges uh, brought on by COVID, um, they have now also accommodated virtual programs as well. And so that's something that we'll get into a, a, a little bit later. Um, applicants that I've been working with for the past year and a half, kind of what we've been doing is some, while some students have opted for virtual programs, other students have been applying for programs that occur up to a year out. Uh, so, and again, we'll get into this later, but so for students applying this October, that can be for opportunities this spring, this coming summer, or the following fall. And so if you are able to plan ahead, uh, then hopefully you can acquire funding uh, well in advance, six to eight to 12 months in advance of when your program may start. Um, and so like I was saying, it's up to $5,000, but for students that do have an interest in language study, specifically in the languages that I have listed on this slide, um, you can apply for what is called a, 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 the Critical Language Gilman Award. Um, and that is if the focus of your program is studying one of these languages and, and you do not need to have prior proficiency, um, but if the focus of your program is studying this language and you have an understanding of how this language language is crucial to your studies, your academic and professional future, then you can be eligible for an additional $3,000. So for a total of $8,000. Um, and this is one that FSU students have had a lot of success with uh, this past year. We've had three recipients, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, but there are very few awards that they give out every year for uh, the, the critical language uh, award for Gilman. Um, so if that's an area of interest, uh, please bring that up when we're meeting. and. You you know, we can at least because even if you apply for the critical language Gilman and you don't receive it, you're still eligible for the base level Gilman, which is still that up to uh, $5,000. Okay, moving on from here. And I, and I do believe uh, we had uh, Aria just joined us. And so if we would like to uh, take a very quick pause, Aria, would you like to introduce yourself really quickly? And then we can uh, get back to you at the very end of the presentation to share a little bit about your experience. Hi, absolutely. Can you hear me? I can unmute myself too really quickly. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Please excuse my life. Um, my name is Ari Halden. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I was a Gilman recipient for the summer of 2019, and I went to Vietnam via the Global Scholars Program here at Florida State. But essentially, I was there teaching English and conducting research for about four months. So I'm here for any questions, and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll be sure to circle back at the end of the presentation. Um, but moving on from here, so just to kind of cover the eligibility for, for the Gilman Scholarship. Um, so it does require US citizenship um, and it requires that you are an enrolled undergraduate uh, in good academic standing with your university. I wouldn't worry about that latter half too much because I, I've never worked with a Gilman student or a Gilman applicant that has been in poor standing. If you have any concerns about that, of course, feel free to bring it up. Um, but you need to be uh, receiving uh, a federal Pell Grant, not just be eligible, or not just be eligible for a Pell Grant, but you need to be receiving it during your time, during your application, and during your experience abroad. Um, and now, where some where some students sometimes um, can get a, a, a little stressed during the application process uh, is that they are like, well, I haven't been accepted to an international program yet. I just have intentions of applying and that is absolutely okay. Um, so you don't, if you're accepted to a program that's occurring this spring, summer or next fall, then excellent. But um, for this application process, um, if you just have a good idea and a good plan and when you would like to do it, that is really all you need. Uh, and so Gilman is flexible to accommodate 
uh, maybe unforeseen changes in your program. So say if you work on an application uh, because you're wanting to go study in Russia for the summer, but it ends up being uh, in U the Ukraine, um, then that's okay. You can submit a program change and, and, and Gilman uh, will accommodate that. Um, and you need to be applying to a country that has a level one or two, uh, and not it, out of a it's level from a level one, two, three, or four, and three or four are deemed higher risk. But if the country you're applying to is a one or two, uh, that's okay. It's obviously been complicated a little bit because of COVID, um, and so some countries that in in any given year are level one or two are, are kind of sitting at that three or four level right now. But again, that shouldn't preclude you from applying to that country because. Hopefully, uh, th those levels will change as you know we get further into the fall semester. So it wouldn't preclude you from being selected if you apply to a country that's currently a level three or four. But I believe it's a uh, if that country doesn't change within five weeks of your departure date, then you do need to uh, plan uh, for something else or defer. Um, but that's the eligibility for Gilman. And so now when we're uh, just kind of thinking about how to get started with this application, so I believe we're about five weeks out from the deadline, which is plenty of time uh, to complete a compelling application. But, but what I would recommend starting uh, first is go to Gilman's website. Um, they have a ton of resources on the website from uh, not just being able to review the essay prompts and being able to go in and maybe jot down some notes for some ideas for your own story or experiences that you want to highlight or things that you want to specifically speak to, um, but they have videos and blogs and they even have a, a Gilman podcast podcast that they started recently, um, where it's a bunch of alumni sharing their experiences, their stories, and tips for navigating the application. Um, so definitely go on there uh, and just kind of get acclimated to this opportunity to learn a little bit more about it, and then we can start breaking down those essays. Now, um, I know for a lot of students, uh, studying abroad is, 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 is a very new subject, and it's something that they haven't really navigated yet, and again, that is absolutely fine. Um, I have plenty of students, usually upper division students, that may find an opportunity and come to me and be like, hey, there's this thing, it's not associated or affiliated with Florida State, but I'm really interested and I would like to do it. That's absolutely fine, um, but for for students, especially lower division students um, that are still, I I always encourage them to start with opportunities that Florida State offers. That does not mean that is what you have to use, um, but at least gives you a good baseline for the types of experiences that are out there, and so. Now, I, so I, I usually categorize um, study abroad programs in, in about like three different categories. Um, so you have your traditional like study abroad, and that's where I'm going abroad and I'm taking classes. Um, and that can be associated with my major, that can just be, or not, I mean, not even, maybe just courses that I find interesting, um, that would just be a fun experience, but, but taking classes abroad. Um, you have kind of your cultural exchange opportunities. And so um, I'm not really taking classes. I'm, I'm not completing an internship, you know, but I'm just, I'm here to engage with the people, the place, and the culture, and there are plenty of programs at Florida State that allow you to do that, and then you have, like, your international internships or your international research experiences, uh, so I'm not taking classes abroad, but I am going abroad to engage with the community, to actively do work, um, and so, so, so whether it's a study program, uh, an internship program, or a cultural exchange program, um, any of those would be eligible for Gilman, and they're all reviewed uh, in the same way and held in the same degree. Um, and so now um, international programs is, is, is oftentimes the most visible type of experience at Florida State University, but by no means the only one. Um, I think they have some phenomenal opportunities, but at least for, uh, and kind of speaking to my own experience as an undergraduate uh, at Florida State University, whenever I heard anything associated with international programs, the first thing that I noticed was that price tag, and I was instantly like, no thanks, uh, that's not for me. Um, and, and, and I strongly encourage you not to think about it in that way uh, because for, for a lot of those programs, um, the price tag tends to be more all-inclusive than a lot of other opportunities you may be looking at. So um, you can also apply to uh, international program specific scholarships. And so for any student that I'm working with that may be interested in an in FSU IP, as soon as we wrap up our Gilman scholarship application, it's like, okay, have you looked into international program scholarships? Because you may be eligible for multiple. Um, so they have identity-based scholarships, they have merit-based scholarships, they have location-specific scholarships. Um, and so I, it's not uncommon for me to work with a student that after they finish their Gilman application are eligible for anywhere from four to five 
IP scholarships that could be paired with uh, their, their Gilman Award. And so I've had students in the past that even for programs through IP that are five figures have had the entirety of that program cost covered uh, by a combination of scholarships that they've applied to. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to genuinely look into those and see if there, if there are study programs that do interest you, uh, take a look at that. Um, in a similar vein, um, so not through international programs, but through FSU's Center for Global Engagement, um, there's a, what is called our Global Exchange Programs. And so that's in the similar vein of study abroad program. So I'm taking classes abroad. But the main difference is that, you know, for an international program through FSU IEP, usually, not always, but usually you're studying at an FSU study center, meaning there are going to be a lot of other Florida State students that'll be in that city, maybe doing different programs, you know, different classes, but you're kind of all congregated in, in, in a similar area. Um, global exchange can be a lot more autonomous. Um, and so there could be instances where I might be the only Florida State student studying at this university in Spain. Um, and so for some students, that's really exciting. And that's something that, they're, that they can't wait to get involved in. Um, for other students, that can be really intimidating. And, and maybe that's something I want to think about maybe down the line, but maybe I want to get my feet wet through a different program. And if that's you, that's absolutely fine too. Um, it's not always the case with Global Exchange. Sometimes there can be anywhere from one to five students, you know, roughly going to, but, it, but it's much, it's a much smaller community uh, and, for, and it's a much more immersive opportunity in some ways. Um, now, uh, when we're thinking about international internships, um, the, the Global Scholars Program through the Center for, Under, uh, Center for Undergraduate Research and Academic Engagement is an excellent opportunity. It is currently a, a little bit in flux. Um, and so, so that's one that because of the pandemic has kind of been uh, grounded and, and is just a, a domestic opportunity. Um, but what you can look through um, is, this, uh, is this site called Ompracash. Uh, it is O-M-P-R-A-K-A-S-H. And we can talk about that more later if that, uh, if this, if an international internship is something that you're looking into. Uh, but what Ompracash does is they help put you in contact with uh, different international nonprofits and organizations that are doing community work, uh, perhaps in your field of expertise or your area of study. Um, and the great thing about Ompracash is that they also offer educational opportunities before you would go. Um, and so that's something you could also use your Gilman funding for, but they, um, they provide coursework um, that helps unpack um, what, is, what does it mean to do service abroad? What does it mean to be an American doing service abroad? Or how can we make sure that this work is done sustainably and, uh, and, and done in partnership with the communities that we're traveling to? Um, and so again, if you're interested in more of a work experience, we can talk about that during a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, and then there's also um, Beyond Borders at Florida State. Uh, and so Beyond Borders is more of the cultural exchange program. Um, and they actually have two destinations. They have a program in Germany that's three weeks long. And then they have a spring break trip uh, to Jamaica that is, that is a week long. And so, um, so with Beyond Borders, and there's actually just been a recent change that we'll uh, talk a little bit more about later. But now Gilman used to have a requirement for it, your program had to at least be three weeks long. They have since this year uh, done away with that. So now any program of any length is eligible. So now both of those programs for Beyond Borders are eligible. Um, and so, so again, if that sounds like an opportunity that you're interested in, um, where you are able to host college students from the country that you're going to, you're able to host them in Tallahassee and do, um, you know, uh, some like, you know, tours and site visits and get to know them. And then they do the same when you go over and they host you. Um, and so it's a program that's been really popular with students in the past. Um, and then down at the very bottom, something that I, that I, and Aria, thank you for posting the link for, for Opera Cash. So that's in the chat if you're, if you're interested. Um, but the, Gilman Scholarship, so for some fellowships that ONF works with, you have to apply through our office. You have to be endorsed by your university. And for Gilman, that's not the case. You can apply to this completely on your own. You never have to see me again if you don't want to, uh, but I would strongly encourage you to, to set up a meeting um, because one, I want to get to know you and I would love to support you, but two, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, and so for students that apply to this opportunity on their own, so this is in the five years that I have been working with uh, Florida State students on the Gilman Scholarship 
scholarship, if you apply on your own, um, you're still being accepted at about 20%, uh, which is which is for some of these fellowships is not a bad number, um, but that's actually below the national average for Gilman, which is usually about like 24% acceptance rate nationally. Um, so it's not bad, could be better. Uh, but for students that are applying with, uh, with the Office of National Fellowship, so if you set up an appointment with me, we sit down, we review your essays, you know, and we help you through that process, that acceptance rate is about 61%. Um, and so again, that's it's about two and a half times the national average. It's still not a guarantee, but your odds are much, much better. And then thinking of just this past year, despite the challenges with the pandemic, uh, students that applied through our office, their acceptance rate was about 90%, which is pretty astronomical. Um, granted, there's been, you know, the, some students had to opt for virtual programs and some students had to postpone, but 90% uh, of students were offered funding through the Gilman Scholarship. So again, strongly encourage you to set up an appointment to chat with us. All right, so moving on from here, um, just to kind of go over what is going to be asked of you in the application, uh, Gilman has modified and their application has evolved uh, in, in small incre increments over the last few years. Uh, but the one element that has remained the same by and large is that statement of grant purpose. And so 7,000 characters, what that equates to is about a page and a half single spaced. Um, so it's, it's not a lot, um, but it, especially when we consider all of the things that we're trying to include in that application. And so again, you can find the prompt on the website, but essentially what the statement of grant purpose is trying to, uh, trying to ascertain is a little bit about your story, your experience, uh, and your goals, but also uh, they want to know about the location that you're applying to, the opportunity that you're applying to. Why is this the best opportunity for you at this point in your academic journey? Or how is this going to prepare you for that, that leap after college, uh, either into your career, into another professional experience or fellowship or opportunity? Um, so the statement of grant purpose is all about where are you going, what are you doing it, or what are you doing, and why are you doing Doing it. And now, traditionally, SA2, it used to solely be this follow on service project. So, after your Gilman experience, what are you doing when you come back to either um, share the Gilman opportunity with your peers um, or to apply what you have learned abroad or to spread knowledge of the culture and the place that you went to um, with students in your community? Again, your community as you define it, that can be in Tallahassee, it can be back home. Um, but, but regardless, it's what are you doing? Um, that is still part of the application, but instead of being the entire essay, they broke essay two into uh, two components. So now you have a 3,000 character follow on service project that again is everything that I just said. What is the community that you want to engage with and how are you going to engage with them? Um, but the building mutual understanding essay is, is all about so you going to this place, uh, this country, this location, this opportunity, um, and it's focused on that cultural exchange that will occur. So it's both what do, you, what do you bring to the table? Uh, so, I mean, based on your lived experiences, based on your story, um, how is that uh, a representation of either, of, or of what it means to be an American as you define it? Or what aspects of American culture are you bringing into this space? Or what aspects of the culture or the place or the people that you're going to be engaged with uh, are you most excited to learn about and, and, and to practice? Um, and so it can kind of be a little bit of both. And so that's kind of what they're looking for in that essay. And then the Critical Need Language Award is that essay is optional. Again, it is only if you are applying to a program that focuses on study of the, the I think, the 15 or 16 languages that were in the list that I included earlier. And so it's a 2,000 character. It's a very short essay, but usually students use that as a, as a means to maybe focus on specific aspects of the language that they need to grow in or that they're challenged by. Um, or it's a way for them to talk about how this language is really crucial uh, to their development in college or their field and or how they hope to use the language moving forward. Um, there's no letter of recommendations. So this application is purely focused on your experiences, your story, your goals, um, and the application itself, which is not hard, it is just lengthy and it's kind of dense and it just takes a while to fill out. And so the, the deadline, I mentioned, I think we're about like five weeks away, is gonna be October 5th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So I would, I would encourage you in your mind, think about that as being 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, because if you're submitting at like 2.59 a.m. on October 6th, it still counts, 
Um, but I hope you're not staying up until three in the morning to work on this application. Um, but but like I was alluding to earlier, this application period, it does not. So if you're if you're planning to study abroad this spring, then this is your application cycle. Um, but if you are planning to study abroad in the summer or next fall, um, or for an academic year long program that begins next fall, um, then you can apply to this deadline. Best case scenario, you are offered funding and then you can just uh, starting in January, start budgeting and start planning and start applying for other opportunities that you could then maybe stack with the funding you could receive from Gilman. Um, uh, or conversely, if you apply for this deadline for a program that is uh, in the summer or fall and you don't receive it. Uh, you can take that application that you developed, we can work on it and workshop it and just reapply for the deadline that is in March. That is also for programs that would start either in the summer, the fall, the next fall, or for the March deadline, the following spring. And so as you can see um, with, with, the, with the dates that are listed, this October deadline is for any program that starts December 1st of this year through October 31st of next year. And the March deadline is gonna be May 1st of 2022, um, all the way up until April 30th of 2023. So again, if you have questions about that, please feel free to ask. Um, but if you can plan ahead, uh, I have seen many, many instances of students that apply early. They benefit from the fact that not as many students apply early. So if you're submitting a competent, uh, like what, like well-written application early, uh, the, the pool's smaller. Um, the closer you get to when you need to go, the pool of students applying for that term is just going to be higher. Um, so if you can plan ahead, I think it's only going to benefit you. And now when we're thinking about the, okay, so on the back end, so you work, we work on your application for the next five weeks, we submit your application, and then we kind of just twiddle our thumbs for the next few months until we hear news. Uh, but this is, this is what the, the Gilman selection committees are looking for. Um, and I've, I've been lucky enough to serve on those review committees twice. Um, and so this, this is kind of how the breakdown works uh, in terms of what they're looking for in your holistic application. Uh, first and foremost is, is your academic preparedness relative to the program that you're applying to and how that program relates to those future goals that you have. Um, so for example, like if you were applying for say like an international research opportunity, um, just in chemistry, we'll say, um, but on your resume, you have done very poorly in all of your field specific coursework, that may give a committee cause for concern uh, as to how you would perform now in a new country in a new setting, but still in that same field. Um, and, but so regardless of the program that you're applying to, uh, we want to make sure that uh, based on the work and the experience and the things that you've done so far, that this would be still challenging, but, uh, but a logical next step for you. Um, the committee is also looking at your diversity of background and experience. That is a very broad, very nuanced uh, definition that they provide in their review materials. But what they're essentially getting is they, they want to know your story. Uh, you know, so they want to know your experiences, things that you've excelled at. Excelled at. Um, in some instances, students present um, stories where they were they, where they were severely challenged and had to overcome that challenge to either be at university or to be uh, pursuing this international program. And I think we can we can present those challenges in a way that highlight your skills and what you bring to the table and that resiliency that you have to now be able to engage and excel in this opportunity that comes next. So don't be afraid to tell your story, um, but Gilman would love to hear it if you do choose to do so. Um, in terms of destination, so you anywhere that is uh, level one or two is eligible for Gilman. Um, but, but Gilman also kind of has this priority that they want to send students to locations that are traditionally underutilized by the American college student. Um, and so they have a slight preference. This is not a guarantee, but it's maybe like a little plus on your application. If you're applying to um, locations within Southeast Asia, um, uh, uh, opportunities uh, in the continent of Africa, or opportunities in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so if you're already considering opportunities in that area, great. Um, if you weren't, maybe you can just, you know, take a look and see if there is anything there that you would be interested in applying to. But of course, uh, if you're looking in Latin and South America or Western Europe or, or anywhere else or Australia, you know, go where would be the best fit for you. Gilman just has like a slight preference for those underutilized destinations. Uh, when it comes to impact to community, 
Um, that's really highlighted in the, um, the essay component that we were just talking about, the Building Mutual Understanding essay. Um, that's really a great place to highlight it, but it's also considering the impact to the community for the follow-on service project. Um, so they want to see the value that you bring to the experience that you're pursuing, um, and they also want to see what you're going to take away from that experience and how you're going to apply it coming back. Um, and then the last one is only if you're applying to the Critical Need Language Award, but Gilman really wants to see the importance and how necessary that language is relative to your academic and professional goals. Now, this, this other little caveat is, is just for students. So the Gilman McCain Scholarship is exactly the same as the Gilman Scholarship. They just have a preference uh, for students that, uh, students who may be the children uh, of active duty or dependents of active duty service uh, service members. And so if, if that's you, then I, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, and I think in your Gilman application, I think if you do select that you are that dependent child of an active duty uh, military member, it automatically uh, converts your application to like the Gilman McCain scholarship because they are looking for people to apply for this opportunity. Um, it's, it's one that I would not say it's a guarantee that if you apply for it, you get it. All I know is that they have more money to give uh, than students who are applying. Uh, but everything about the application is the same. Um, it's just that it doesn't have the specific Pell Grant requirement. Um, it's just if you are if you are receiving financial aid, uh, that then you you qualify as long again as long as you are that child dependent. So if that's you, then we should definitely talk about the Gilman McCain Scholarship. Um, now th that so that's it for Gilman. I'm just going to breeze through some of these other opportunities just to be like, hey, if this sounds interesting to you, put it on, write it down, just have it on your radar, uh, because I really want to get Aria in on this conversation. Um, and so now the Freeman Asia Scholarship, it is very similar to Gilman. It is just region specific. Um, and so it's for these, uh, so for opportunities through Florida State or through your uni uh, university that exist within Southeast Asia, um, it's, it's not due until later in the spring semester. So usually by then you will know if you have funding from Gilman or not. Um, if you need more funding, then we can consider the Freeman Asia Scholarship, or if you don't receive Gilman, we can consider the Freeman Asia Scholarship, or after a Gilman experience, if you still are interested in studying abroad, or you're interested in Southeast Asia, then this is an opportunity we should consider. Um, it, the, the requirements are very similar to Gilman. It does have a minimum GPA requirement of a 2.8, and it does have a length requirement of at least eight weeks. Um, but outside of that, it's going to be very similar to what you would see with the Gilman Scholarship. And then some of these other opportunities. Um, so if you are interested in, in language study, and if you're interested in that list of languages I went through earlier, um, then yes, you can apply through the Gilman Scholarship, but there's also the Critical Language Scholarship which I believe has that exact same list. Um, and so this uh, CLS opportunity is for, it's, it's only summer, so it's a little bit more restricted than Gilman, uh, but it is an intensive language study program. Um, and so they, they equate the gains that you're gonna gain that summer um, and they're about two month long opportunity to what you would gain in a year's worth of coursework at your university. So it is rigorous, um, but if you're looking for language study, I think there are a few programs that are better. Um, Humanity in Action, this is uh, eligible if you are a sophomore, junior, or senior, or um, within two years of graduating. Um, this is a, I believe it's an eight week, it's four, eight week, uh, but regardless, it's a summer program that focuses on human rights and social justice. Um, so they have locations in Europe, they have a location in the United States, um, and it's, it's a cohort model um, where the, regardless of where you are placed, um, you're studying human rights and social justice from both a contemporary and a historic perspective relative to the region that you are studying in. Uh, so for example, the American destination is in Atlanta and the, the framework by which they're working is the, the civil rights movement. And so they bring in guest speakers, there are site visits, there, uh, there's a capstone project that you and your cohort complete. Um, whereas if you're placed in one of the European destinations, kind of the framework by which they're working from is the Holocaust. Um, it, obviously a very nuanced definition of the Holocaust. And again, that historic and contemporary perspective and how communities are still being impacted. Um, and so they look for students from every academic discipline. Um, and so they wanna see how are you 
um, interested in these subjects relative to your, uh, your area of expertise or your studies, uh, because what they're wanting to create are those change agents as they enter their career post-college. Um, the Curtis Scholarship, uh, this is again, not it, it's not a deadline until late in the spring semester, um, but it is for students that are, in, that, that are interested in studying abroad um, opportunities. Um, but if you are focused on issues related to extreme poverty or hunger, um, and so it's about a 10 day trip to South Africa that takes place during the summer. And then I believe uh, a week long trip to New York City uh, during the fall. Um, and so if, if, if that sounds like something you might be interested in, it, it, it kind of ties in a little bit of um, the Humanity in Action Scholarship, maybe a little bit of the Gilman Scholarship, um, but, but what they're looking for are, are students, again, that want to be change agents relative to, um, to extreme poverty uh, and hunger. Um, the US-UK Fulbright Summer Institute, that is for freshmen and sophomore students, um, that is focused on cultural exchange, specifically in the United Kingdom. Uh, they have anywhere, and it changes yearly. I think right now it's uh, about four or five locations where you apply to a specific institute. Um, so all of them focus on cultural exchange, but each institute has a different area of focus. Um, so there, there used to be one that's focused on business uh, in the past, uh, both business local to the UK, but international business. There was one that was focused on climate change a few years ago. Um, the one, there's one that's been pretty consistent that does focus on arts, activism, and social justice at the University of Bristol. Um, that one's really popular with a lot of Florida State students. Uh, and it's actually, we sent two students to that program a couple of years ago. Um, so it does have a bit of a high GPA requirement. It's about at a 3.7. Um, but the good news is if you're early in your academic career at Florida State, um, you, your GPA can be very volatile. So even if you didn't perform maybe during the summer, or maybe the, you know, if you were in your sophomore year, maybe last year as well as you wanted to, but you're still close to that cusp, um, it's still within the realm of possibility that if you do well this semester, you can meet that threshold because it's not until it's a, it's a spring deadline as well. Um, and lastly, the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. Uh, this is one that uh, Aria just recently wrapped up, uh, and I am very proud of all the hard work that she did. Uh, but the Fulbright U.S. Student Program is for graduate, is for rising seniors or graduate students, um, and it is for anywhere from an eight to twelve or even thirteen month study abroad program that's focused on either research. Um, a graduate degree, so pursuing like a master's or a PhD degree, um, or um, uh, English teaching abroad. Um, and obviously the, the English teaching is very nuanced dependent on where you're applying to. Um, and it's not just for career educators. What they're looking for are cultural ambassadors uh, and people that are genuinely interested in engaging with the place and the culture uh, and the region that they're going to. So if any of those sound interesting, uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a look. Um, we can also bring that up in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, again, my name is Jesse. So if you would like to write down my contact information, uh, feel free to do so um, and just shoot me an email. Um, but uh, Dr. Filer is, is also in the in the office. We're a little bit short staffed right now because one of a colleague just recently left to pursue graduate school on their own. Um, and so Christine is, a, is is new to our office. And, um, and if we're going to be meeting, I'm going to try to get her acclimated to Gilman and a few of these other fellowships. And so I may ask you if you'd be comfortable with her attending. Um, but she has a background in student affairs and is, and is ready to go and really excited to learn about uh, the Gilman Scholarship and others as well. Um, so feel feel free to email me or anyone else in the office and we would love to chat with you. Uh, and so I am going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment. Um, and so uh, this, so I'd love for Aria to is going to share a little bit about her experience uh, with the Gilman Scholarship, and uh, then we'll both be available to answer questions. So if you need to go, thank you so much for joining. Uh, but if you would like to stay, uh, please feel free, uh, and, and we'll get to your question shortly. But Aria, if you would like to take it away and share a little bit about what you were able to do with the Gilman Scholarship. Yeah, hello again. Thank you, Jesse, for that fantastic presentation on Gelman. It kind of gives me nostalgia from when I first saw Jesse my freshman year talking about Gelman. But um, a little bit about my Gelman experience. And also, if you want to hear more about my Gelman experience, kind of plugging, um, I will be on the Gelman Scholarships Instagram live stream this Friday from oh gosh times i don't have an instagram so like they're just like haha make one and we'll just put you on it but it will be from 
3 to 3.30. So just a 30 minute conversation about what my experience was it's, and ask me anything. So if there's a question that you maybe have later, definitely reach out to me on that. And also other Gilman alumni ambassadors, I'll explain what that is, will be doing theirs in the next few weeks. So it won't be just me, you'll hear other stories as well. But a little bit more about me again. So my name is Aria, I feel like I said that three times already. I went to Vietnam with the Gilman Scholarship with Global Scholars, as Jesse mentioned, which currently is not what it was when I went, but what it was, it was a opportunity for you to intern abroad with a specific organization on Opera Cash, which works with many different countries across the world for about at most a few months, at least a few weeks at a specific interest or area that you were interested in. So everything from education, health, law, whatever it may be, there was a program for it. So with my Gilman application experience, I knew about Gilman since my freshman year because Jesse did one of these for the CARE program. I am a CARE alum. I graduated Florida State in 2020. And essentially I knew about it since my freshman year, but didn't apply all the way to my junior year because I really didn't think I would get it. I was like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's interesting. I don't think I'm qualified. I really don't think I have the background they're looking for. Or if I did, I didn't know how to write my story in an essay. You're usually taught to write about something else. So, or if you're writing about yourself, it's very formulaic. So I didn't really know how to do a personal statement or other things that were needed for this application. But I did reach out to Jesse because I was interested in applying to Global Scholars. So I applied to Gilman and Global Scholars at the same time, not knowing if I would get either of them. And essentially I was originally applying to Cambodia. And the reason why is because I went to Thailand after my freshman year for a two week program with Give Volunteers. I was interested in that. We could talk about that at some point. And I felt like I didn't really get the best experience. And I'm like, I shouldn't give up on Southeast Asia. Like there's so much in this region of the world. And like two weeks is not enough to learn anything about any country. I mean, you will learn a few things, but I mean, I wanted to explore more in depth instead of like in the kind of scheduled the planned excursion I had. So I chose Cambodia. And um, Jesse also told me that Southeast Asia was just one of those places where they're like, you know, we need a little bit more applicants. Like everyone wants to go to England, but like no one wants to go to Cambodia. So I'm like, all right, of course not. No one wants to go to Cambodia, but many people don't apply to Cambodia. So when I applied, um, I heavily focused on and the application looked a little different in 2019 than it does now. The, that there were two essays, and of course, Jesse mentioned it was now split into three. But essentially, it's similar components. And I talked about how I wanted to try this region of the world again. And my background being Jamaican American, I'm originally from South Florida, already having this exposure to different cultures, but wanting a culture I just I didn't necessarily grow up alongside when I was younger and living in South Florida. So I added that in as well as like wanting to connect it back to the care program. So if you are a part of the care program or something similar, um, connecting it back in like, let's say your um, follow on project or connecting it back to any community that you might align with is definitely a great way of showcasing that this will go past yourself and your stories will be essentially kind of like a passed down conversation to other people in your community who might want to go abroad at some point in their own lives. So I did that. I was there for four months. I was teaching English, conducting research. I was in Northern Vietnam in a rural province. There was no tourist industry at all. So I was one of two Americans. The other American was a person I went with via the Global Scholars Program. And essentially it was a really great experience. I had a lot of I guess a lot of clarity on what I want to do next. And since I was a junior going into my senior year that summer, I really it really solidified a few things for me. One, wanting to go abroad again. Two, wanting to teach. And three, wanting to trust myself in an application process that I didn't really think I had before then. So I definitely think those helped solidify those goals for me. And also, I think Gilman also helped me feel more confident in applying to other things. So I applied to Beyond Borders Jamaica, and I was a part of that. And Sally didn't get to go because of COVID, but I was a part of that. And I was also a part of a few other things throughout Florida State that involved international travel or um, anything related to that realm. So if anyone wants to speak to me about that, we can definitely talk about it. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of my experience and spiel and I would love to open it to questions. I'll expand more in the Instagram live, which please let technology be on my side. I don't I don't know what's going on, but that's my keep my fingers crossed for you too. Any questions for Aria?
because I know that. Oh, Maybe, can yes, you, you can definitely have my email. Let me give it to you. So, like, the reason why I was so late, I'm so sorry. Um, they wouldn't allow me in on my email that wasn't an FSU email. So, I will give you my FSU email, and I check that regularly because, as Jesse said, I just finished my Fulbright application, and I'm still, still shaking in my boots. Chelsea has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jesse and Aria. Um, I'm so excited about this program and just like everything that you guys are doing. I'm very passionate about helping people in just like third world and like kind of under over, under like like countries in poverty. I'm really passionate about that. And I'm also a care student. I just just finished my care semester um, this year. So I'm care class of 2021. And my question to Aria, <laughs> thank you. My question to Aria is how did you like once you came back from your trip, how did you like share your knowledge and your like and what you experienced um, in the country that you went to? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, congratulations getting through your care summer. Oh, that's so great. Mm -hmm. Those are interesting memories. But basically, when I came back, um, I did a few things. So it and one thing that Preacher Jesse has touched on is that what you write about in your essay is not necessarily what you have to do when you come back. They just want to know that you have an idea of what you're doing, but they're not going to necessarily check up and be like, did you do these exact things in this exact way that you wrote it? Like, it's not really their priority. They're just hoping that you do something when you come back. So um, a few of the things I did, first and foremost, I was able to talk to a care, there was usually we had these monthly care meetings, which I don't know how they look now because of COVID, but they were in like the HBC 101, the huge room that was there. And essentially they had a panel and they were talking about Gilman recipients and what they did in their experiences and how their awards um, kind of transferred into their academic lives after they came back. And I was a part of that. So I was able to speak to the individuals that were there, share my experiences. And it was great because people actually reached out to me from that. And they're like, oh, you were so honest and you were so vulnerable about your experiences. Because although I enjoyed my time in Vietnam, it wasn't perfect, especially being a Black woman in Southeast Asia in a rural area. I was one of the first Black people some people have ever seen, and there were like a mix of reviews and mix of reactions. So definitely um, a lot of people resonated with that. But also another thing that I did was I, there is, I don't know if it's still going on, but there's a going global um, kind of like presentation that the globe puts on. And I was able to like kind of make a little poster board about my experience and present there. Um, I've also talked about it briefly in a few other areas and arenas, um, just kind of around campus, like in my anthropology class, I was an anthropology major, I forgot to mention that. Um, so I was able to talk in my anthropology class about this experience and how it can help other individuals interested in world cultures and traveling and service be a part of that via the Gilman scholarship. So I did that as well. But also like, beyond the classroom, Gilman also helped me when it came to applying for the U.S. Peace Corps. So I applied to the U.S. Peace Corps and I was invited to serve with Peace Corps Mongolia. And I think Peace Corps might align well with what you were saying, Chelsea, if you're interested in service, going to a different country, maybe being and working alongside the community. Um, that was something that definitely helped, I think, solidify my application because I knew going in what they were kind of expecting based on my experiences in Gilman interning abroad. Now, if I studied abroad, that might be different, but interning abroad did help me in that arena. So hopefully that answered your question. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add is when you're thinking of that project, uh, I, I it was it was always more impactful as a reviewer when the idea was feasible. It didn't, you didn't need to change the world uh, if it was just you were changing someone's world, you know, and so it's like if you were involved on campus when any of the organizations that Aria mentioned, you use that, you know, I'd, I've had students that have talked about going back to their high schools, you know, that want they want to, they want to, they want to, you know, open up not just, you know, opportunities through care, but how to apply for college and, you know, how to apply for once you're in college, you know, these types. So if it's, if it's feasible and I can believe it as a reviewer that you can do this with the resources that you have, I think that holds just as much weight as somebody who wants to, you know, create their own, you know, I've, like art installations I've read in the past where I'm like, that's a great idea. Um, and and, and I, I think you can do it, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort to do that. Um, so Feel free to be creative, but also feel free to be pragmatic. Um, and so Kayla has a question. 
Hello, everyone. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. I was having technical difficulties, but I'm here now. So I don't want you guys to like go back and say everything all over again. But I just wanted to ask, like, um, so how will we go about like actually getting assistance from you guys with the whole application process? And I also heard um, something about like sharing your experience experiences. So is that not not that that's a problem? I would love to do that. But like, is that a part of like the Gilman scholarship where they want us to go back and like share our experiences? Or is that like with you guys or something? I don't know. Um, well, quickly, I'm putting my email address in the chat. Um, and so feel free to reach out to me if you would like to, to set up an appointment. And I, I'm recording this presentation, so I can I will send that out um, if you would like to go back to that. But would be happy to talk to you more about the specifics and details of, of the scholarship during a one on one. And then also kind of touching on a few of your questions too. Um, I mentioned that I was a Gilman Alumni Ambassador. So what that role also entails, it's not only being a part of these conversations, but also I do help with applications and I do help with helping you kind of get those ideas on paper that Jesse will of course fine tune and get it into the format that's needed for this application. But I'm also a resource that you're more than welcome to email me. I will drop my email in the chat again, just in case for any latecomers that maybe didn't see it before. Um, I can definitely help you along this process as well. And touching on with what you said, um, yes, connecting it back to the community once you return is not just a Florida State thing, but a Gilman thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, it's Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just have a question because like, I've missed my freshman year. I'm a sophomore now, and I'm also a part of CARE. Um, but like I missed my whole freshman year experience. So I wasn't very involved. Um, so like, how would that work with my, you know, essay, uh, you know, thing? I think there is more so than other review committees that I've, that I've served on. Um, I think there is, there's a, a, a great deal of understanding of, for the Gilman review process for like the holistic application and experience. And so, although this last year was not traditional in any sense of the word uh, and students were challenged in very nuanced and, and, and just completely unique ways, um, I still think there can be a story to be told uh, that that centers around that, uh, that that can that can maybe give even even more credence to why you want to do and pursue this opportunity and this experience and how this is going to help you re engage with your studies and your major. Um, and, and have the college experience that you envisioned for yourself a year ago when you started um, and so. I, I would say, you know, be aware of that challenge, um, but, I, but I don't think it's necessarily something that you need to shy away from. Um, I think that would just give even more reason why this would be the perfect time for you to apply for uh, the Gilman Scholarship, but also whatever opportunity that you might find. And I also want to add to that too, with all of these applications, even the ones that Jesse mentioned toward the end of the presentation, you don't necessarily have to be this um, just like decorated accolade, like accolade of a scholar. You don't have to have many experiences to still be a part of this. Because for, for many people, and I'm pretty sure the people that review the application will acknowledge, this could be your first experience that kind of spearheads other experiences in your future. And that's completely fine. And that is 100% expected, especially in college where a lot of us are still figuring out what we want to do and where we want to go. So don't feel like you need to have a certain amount of prior experience to do this experience. Because as Josie mentioned, it's very accessible in the sense that there are no letters of rec, there is no minimum GPA, they really do want your story. So definitely, if you're comfortable, feel free to share that with them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions while we have Aria here? Yeah, I'm an open book. Any questions at all? And also more questions I'll answer on Instagram Live. If you guys can help me on Instagram Live, I'm kidding. No, it's okay. They taught me how to use it. It's, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not very tech savvy. I would love to help, but I would probably give you wrong information. <laughs> Yeah, but anything else at all, even how CARE can, because I know with Gilman, um, you know, CARE, and I'm pretty sure they still do, they still have the writing 
the center's kind of like care specific writers that can help you with like looking at your, app, oh, looking at your application. I think the best thing is, and Jesse might echo this, is having multiple set of eyes look at your application, regardless of the application. Jesse's a fantastic person to go to. I've been working with Jesse since I was a freshman, but also having other people look at it, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's people at the reading writing center, whether it's individuals that can help you just kind of shape and cultivate that story a little bit more. Like, don't be afraid to shove it in people's faces. Of course, politely, but don't be afraid to shove it in people's faces. Yeah, and I think that'll be a great way for um, for our new graduate assistant, Christine, to come into the picture too, um, is that we can meet and lay the foundation. And then I can always, you know, have you meet a, take a week and meet with Christine instead of meeting with me, just so somebody completely new can read your stuff. Um, but I'll be the first to admit that, you know, I, I've worked with enough essays to know like kind of the basics of, of grammar, but I am no like expert. When it's I, We focus a lot on like ideas and organization and how to like best get, you know, but so I'll make, you know, notes where, where appropriate. But if you can balance our meetings with uh, somebody that can just go in and give you all the technical pieces as well, you know, then I think that's, that's, that's really preparing as best you can for this application. All right. And also one thing I want to add before we end off, I am one of 25 other alumni ambassadors. So if you are someone that's interested in studying in a specific part of the world or studying, interning, or even doing a virtual internship, we have people in our group that can speak to that with their own experiences. So if you want to reach out to me to talk about something specific, guaranteed or I hope I can guarantee that I at least know someone that's familiar with at least that area, that idea, that location. So don't be afraid to reach out. But we'll stay here for a few more minutes. But you know, for those of you that need to leave, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and I hope to hear from you soon. Um, but for those of you who may still have a question, feel free. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.